guys. Oh. oh, aren't the old ones really cool? The two-door Range Rover, the Range Rover Classic, the soft dash, the and then sort of be negative about the modern things. I just think we're definitely in a time now where we've got to have a little look in the mirror the way we do things. These are all excellent reasons in a way to buy them, but actually the worst reasons of all. Hello and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast. We're officially middle-aged. We've hit the big 4-0. This is the 40th episode of Car Chat Nonsense. But we're going to start off with a subject that some of us, in fact all of us, might have some inner anger about. It's the SUV debate. There's a bit in the media again about how wasteful these vehicles are, and they really are. And my, my headline statement is, I think that in five years' time, many people that have owned these vehicles or stolen these vehicles might be ashamed to have ever done so. Um, I'm going to start off with the person that will be chomping at the bit to talk about this, Chris Cooper, because I'm sure he's got lots. I've got a timer on. You've got 10 minutes, then you have to stop, OK? OK. Uh, BMW X6, oh. Audi SQ8. Anybody who owns one of those should be ashamed now. <laughs> actually, the, the limiting case of this debate, because actually I don't think many people or most people will be ashamed. I think there's a number of reasons for that. But the limiting case, the limited example of how daft this has become was the frenzy, and everybody must have seen this, in the markets. When the Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT, the coupe oh. funny looking thing, arrived a year or two ago, year last year or two years, couldn't, couldn't get them for love nor money. They were going for what I understand in the trade is called overs, for significant sums of money. Meanwhile, the in every way superior Porsche Panamera Turbo S wagon, non-hybrid, couldn't give them away. Couldn't give them away. And the RVs of the two now are just sort of miles and miles apart. Go figure. I mean, there's just no, there's something about, and they're probably not very attractive tra human traits about being high up, there's a bit of a bit of bullying about some of them, isn't there? And when the X6 first arrived, I don't think I saw an X6 being driven in anything remotely resembling a Christian or indeed any other faith-based way. <laughs> right, we're going to pause you for a minute and bring Neil Clifford in, who's shaking his head. I can't tell whether he's disagreeing or doing an impression of Stevie Wonder. It, it, it was one or the he, other. He is, he is dressed like an X6 driver today. No, oh. no, I'm not. <laughs> he's not hot. Yeah, I've, it's your I've office. Not... I've, okay. I've management by walking about. It's a very good book. Now, you're, you are brilliant at sitting on, in the middle of all this stuff. You can drive anything because you're a bit of a chameleon. So how do you drive big, powerful SUVs and not feel guilty? Or I just any think, SUV? I think they're great. I think, I think you can't be... You can't argue against the market. You can't argue against the commercial realities of the world with cars. I love my new Alpina touring estate thing. My wife wouldn't... <laughs> Oh, bless you, Chris. My, wooden, my wife Sorry. wouldn't like to drive it. She prefers her 4x4. Four four. And frankly, I like 4x4s. Four we can't just sit here and go, oh, aren't the old ones really cool? The two-door Range Rover, the Range Rover Classic, the soft dash, the, and then sort of be negative about the modern things. I think... You give it a go. No, of course. And I, I respect those opinions, be it that I believe they're wrong. Can I, put it, can, I, can I add a bit of context to him? I think many of us feel that this is in the context of urban driving, that, that the majority of these vehicles live in town. They, their journeys that they complete are no longer than two or three miles. They're often with one or two people in them. And if you, I, I often say this, but if I was to invite an alien down to this planet and say, this is the way we travel in our biggest city, I think they'd go, you lot lost the plot a long yeah. time ago. Because they just... They just don't fit or work. Well, just because they're a little bit higher. But they're massive. When you if you if you had a fleet of 
Citroen, or sorry, a Renault Zoe's outside the school gate versus a fleet of Range Rovers, it'd make a massive difference. No, but you don't. In the UK, in the UK it certainly would. You don't yeah. feel safe. I think there's a safety thing. I like the being up high thing. I adored my G Wagon, as did you, Mr. Harris. Oh, God, don't get me wrong. They have an appeal, but in town where they spend most of their life, I don't. I live opposite a school. And when I see in the morning all the parents arriving in Range Rovers with one adult and one kid, I just think, you, that can't be pleasant. You can't find a parking space. The thing's enormous. What, what are you doing with it? They, you they have be, a place. You can't be racist against people that live in towns. No, you can't. But also you could. But if I I tend to adjust my behaviours according to where I live. Yeah. So so if I, you know, if I lived in the Sahara Desert, I'd probably, you know, have something that carried quite a bit of fresh water. But I think I think the KNGT is one of the coolest modern four by fours around. It's a four it's, it's door. A, it's a four door GT3. Why wouldn't you want that? It's brilliant. Is, has Ali G broken into this podcast this week? Because somebody dressed Africa. like him in the no, corner. I, I, I just think you guys are all a bit sheep-like, be it that I am dressed as a sheep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's the opposite. It's because uh, everybody much... wanted everybody wanted a Cayenne GT. And in any objective sense, you'd say it doesn't stop as well, doesn't corner as well. It isn't actually quite as fast. And it doesn't actually fit as much stuff inside. As well. from, what I under, from what I understand, that's not the case. It does uh, it does all of those things quite well. What well, does them quite well? Out, out of interest, Chris, you 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 had one recently, didn't you? You were lent one, I think. Okay, and GT. I've driven one, yeah. You were. Um, but what, what do they need it to be in the coupe? Yes, only available in coupe. No, I know, but do, for dynamically, does that matter, or could it be in the more the dynamic thing? Utilitarian. These these uh, chassis engineers are so clever now. They've managed to make this really big, heavy stuff perform on the road in a way that you wouldn't imagine. You like to say, oh, it's too heavy, it won't handle. They tend to. Um, you know, you, you tend to be blown away by them. I remember doing a test of an Urus versus a RS6 for Top Gear. You'd have thought the RS6 would run rings around it. Not at all. In fact, the Urus is probably more agile. So I, I get that side of it. I just think we, we, we're definitely in a time now where we've got to have a little look in the mirror the way we do things. And if you drive around in a car that is probably twice as heavy as it needs to be, it's very difficult to argue against that. You know, at some point, some legislator is going to come along and go, right, you've been a bit too greedy there. You didn't need to have 2.7 tonnes, so we're going to tax you for it. It's coming, and I think we've been a bit stupid. I get that. And, and I, I, um... I am a, I'm a great exponent of the, of the family estate car. I just don't, I don't get these big trucks at all. For me, the, the, the idea that billions and billions of dollars are spent every year making these things go off-road, they've all got buttons to go off-road. What's that all about? Yeah. So, so Chris, the, I, I, uh, if you remember, I sent um, a Guardian article around over the weekend, and um, it was all about was brave. You know, well, you know, it's funny actually. I got yeah. Neil's response here actually to all of you. I mean, I sent the article to all of you. Neil's response here it says regarding SUVs, Guardian money fuckers. <laughs> I don't think that was me. To... That was someone else. <laughs> <said that. laughs> yeah. Neil's not but here today. What what I thought was really quite telling about the article, obviously it's going to be in the Worthy Guardian, but the his headline points were all the things that you've already said, Chris, which is one, they're extremely heavy. So they take more fuel up, but they also create more <laughs> microplastics because you pointed out a couple of weeks ago, tires are no longer made of rubber. They're made of very, very complicated plastics and they they do th he said that um in the article that there's a lot of data now saying that if you're hit by one of these and it makes it makes complete sense you may feel very comfortable inside with your single child but if you hit a kid with one of these you're much more likely to injure them because of the mass at 20 miles an hour parking is a nightmare with these and i know that um, my son went to school around the corner i mean we were very lucky it was 100 yards away when um when he went to prep school, but there was um, a massive preponderance of four by fours. And if you live in this kind of bell sized park area where you have parking on both sides of the street, you effectively have a one way system, which is an informal one way system. And I, I think driving one of these massive cars does provoke enormously antisocial behavior. But when people get stressed, so around dropping kids off, you know, around picking up your shopping, trying to get to the car just in time before your parking rent. I mean, people behave terribly in them. And there was just one last telling thing to this Guardian journalist took 
Um, I guess it was a Range Rover. He didn't say what what make the car was. He said he went to a dealership kind of pretending to be a potential customer. He has a tiny hatchback. He said he, he, he drove out on this. He said the first thing he did was sort of panic, trying to reverse it out of the, uh, the dealership. But then he said he got out to a junction and the gaps were too small. And, and, the, and the dealer just turned around and said, just, just go in, watch what happens. And he said he just pulled out into traffic and no one wanted to argue with the three-ton four-by-four. And his final big point was, he said, what about these sort of um, road humps then? And he said, well, just go for it. And he said he did. He just put his foot down, went over a bunch of sleeping policemen, couldn't feel them. He said, these are all excellent reasons in a way to buy them, but actually the worst reasons of all. You know, you become extremely selfish. It's all about you. It's not about anyone else. I, and um, go off road. And I'm more importantly, <laughs> what, did he, what did he say, Neil? <laughs> no, no, I was joking. I think the the um, you can't argue with consumerism, can you? Well, why are we why are we trying to draw rules about what people should and shouldn't like? Are we going back to Russia in the 30s? No, definitely not doing that. Definitely not doing that. There's a middle, but there's a middle, right. but there's a middle you ground. About cigarettes, though, I guess, in the same way, you know? You should should you just be able to smoke where you want? Should we be able to advertise them? To yes. any demographic? <laughs> yes. Think, is, there yeah. not, is there not a middle ground? I mean, I've written about this before. Yes. The, 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 the car industry in the 80s and 90s was, was engineer-led. And so car, car makers had good ideas and they sold them to us. And the BMW X5 changed all that. Because after that, the car makers started making cars it thought people might want or it started pandering to customer clinics. So that's why in the 80s and 90s, you had the Renault Espace the scenic, really clever, versatile cars that were that were practical, but also inoffensive. And then suddenly you got into the truck era where it was just right, everyone wants a truck. I yeah, do the cash guy, the Nissan the cash guy kills the self, scenic. These things are self-fulfilling. And I think the, the customer's always right argument, but I give you the Escort Mark IV. You know, they sold loads of those, but that was the single worst car ever made. People yeah. still bought it. The Third Reich was quite popular in Germany for a while. You know, people... Oh, make, come on. People, People make mistakes, you know they do. Sorry, sorry, just one one, one question. It, <laughs> in the article, it said that they are much more profitable than um, smaller cars, and they actually argue the Fiesta didn't go out because it was a bad car because there were no customers. The profit margins on a Fiesta are much less than the profit margins on some massive four by four. Of course, well, that's, that's, you know, that makes yeah, total sense. So I, I, I just have a, I, I don't, I don't know <laughs> any other part of our lives where we have something that's so over-engineered and whose ultimate abilities we use so little of than the SUV. When you see, you know, when you see a Ineos going to, there's a couple of come to school, my, the school near where I live. You're like, right, I'm glad you've got your 1.6 meter wading depth and you've got your ingress <laughs> and whatever angles. I mean, I don't, you know, put it this way, you might see someone go to walk to the coffee shop in their hiking boots and someone might have a fridge that's got some functionality they don't use, but I don't know any other walk of life where there's something that, that you use or buy yeah. that, whose ability you just don't use. It's just, it's just, yeah, but that, oh, to be honest with you, that could be said about pretty much issues. every car on the road, every sports car. Uh, you, could, car. you could say that, but I bet yeah. you, I bet you they're using more of it. And at the very least, they're enjoying yeah. it. I don't know. Yeah. Not... I, I think it, it, it for, given the fact you talked about in an urban environment, I would agree with, I, I was, I wasn't in the office yesterday and I went to, uh, I, I drove up to Hyde Park um, to, to walk the dogs with my wife. And uh, I'm, I'm not normally driving around London during the middle of the day, but the traffic was, was chaos. And that was because of delivery vans. It was because of poor parking, roadworks. And there are a lot of roads in London that are not configured for a four by four on one side of the road, a four by four on the other side of the road, a delivery van dropping something off. You know, we are probably at capacity in London with the, with these cars, whilst you're trying to function a normal life. On the other hand, you go to the U S or probably many um, European cities where that when the snow comes, it comes hard uh, the driving's poor, these massive trucks, rigs, you probably wouldn't want to be in a Zoe yeah. on the highway in New York, or you'd want to be in an Escalade or something like that, so you're somewhat visible. And it just do it doesn't have the same uh, effect as it does in somewhere like London and, and probably Clifton and, the you know, the back streets of Clifton. You fill those up with SUVs there's, and uh, it comes to a standstill. There's no such thing as the back streets of Clifton. There's just Clifton. 
Wait, I'm I like the Escalade. Escalade, I have to say. All right, Mark, don't get me wrong. In their environment, I love them. Yeah, if yeah. You're driving, it's fitness you know, for purpose. The, number, the amount of time I've been driving through Africa or the subcontinent in a massive SUV going on a Top Gear job when you're in a big land cruise, you think this is what this is built for. This is absolutely mm. brilliant. Mm. But I just don't, I don't get why we, it's a bit like taking a GT3 RS into a river. I don't, you know, I don't do that very often either. No. Isn't the, cha the challenge then is with the, with the manufacturing companies, maybe that they need to, do, uh, they need to design some other things. Cause I think yeah. the GT looks a lot prettier than a Panamera. Panamera oh. looks like a sausage. I think the, that that's a good point, Neil. And one, one thing that I, um, I thought you liked a sausage. <laughs> what, what, one thing that's really interesting, I think Port Porsche are particularly oh. good at this. If you put some sort of sort of GT badge or engine on any model that's that they point. do, yeah. it will become a desirable thing. You yeah. do a you do you take the ugliest Porsche and give it to Visac and get them to put you know a, a, do a GT3 yeah. RS version of it. It'll become the most popular overinflated car. It's a bit dog out, whistly, out there. isn't it? But they yeah. haven't done a GT sausage. <laughs> no, they should don't need to. They don't need to. It's too good in its basic form. Oh. Volks, yeah. I think Volkswagen don't they don't they produce their own sausages for their staff? I think there was a story about there that. Is a, there is a sausage uh, factory is. on the site of the. There, there is, well, yeah. there, there is. is, there is. This, is a, this week's uh, this week's two car garage is going to be our take our favourite two four by fours for <laughs> London life. <laughs> isn't it nice? Isn't it just nicer to be a little bit higher? Isn't there that is that? And that's why they were, and that's why the cash guy when it first came along, two thousand and eight or nine, when it was because the Renault seen it. The Renault Scenic was a really clever car. I remember bombing around ski resorts in the end of the 90s in a Renault Scenic thinking, it's just, it does everything. It seats move, it's quite versatile. Cash Guy came along, a little bit higher, looked quite nice. First Cash Guy, yep. it's got a bit silly yep. now. And suddenly, everybody wanted one. And there is that, you know, I like SUVs. I've had a, I've, years ago, a few years ago, I had a, the last model, Range Rover Sport, not the SVR, but the V8, green, clear glass, Tanning Seven size. Yep. And that's a rare, that's did a rare everything. car. Sport's did everything. Say again? The Sport is a bit dodgy. It was lovely. It just did everything. It was really nice to drive. It was subtle enough. Uh, made a nice noise. Um, so there, there is a place for, you know, they, they can be did good. Did you drive that into London, Chris? Did I drive it into London? Yeah. Um, I might have driven into London. Yeah. On occasion. Oh, Lexus, yeah, on occasion. Lexus LM. On occasion. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Now, Chris, Chris Cooper, many years ago when we would be driving to Germany to go racing cars, you'd pick me up on certain things I'd said. I just want to review something you said there, which was a, piece, a particularly incisive piece of feedback <laughs> on the behaviour, the dynamic behaviour of that car. It was really nice to drive. Yeah. <laughs> it was nice. I like driving. I, I did my best ever time from Spa back to Eurotunnel ever, even including the times when there were no Belgian police, in a Range Rover Sport, it must Dude. have been. It was. Remember the two thousand that you were there, yeah. two thousand eighteen Spa Classic, the one that finishes at midnight. There was yeah. a Eurotunnel train, sort of middle of the morning before they stopped the following day. I thought, if I leave now, I'll get it. That's my yeah. best ever time. Range Rover, that's my Range Rover. Oh, Sport. I, I, I can see them. I, I, I suppose because I'm mathematically dyslexic or whatever that means. Uh, I'm dysnumeric. I, I, I'm a bit fascinated by numbers, and when people present numbers to me, I, I, I try and engage with them. On a simple level, I think to myself, we're on borrowed time with the internal combustion engine. We've been told by politicians and everyone that hates us that we've got until 2030 or 2035 to buy new ICEs, and that's it. And I think to myself, if that's based on the limited amount of mathematics that have done on this, and that's because we all drive around in two and a half ton Range Rovers, does that mean that if we all drove around in one and a half ton cars and used half as many resources to build them and half as much fuel to run them, we could have another 10 years driving them? I, 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 obviously, that's that's fanciful. But it does make me think, have we been too wasteful over the last 10, 15 years with these trucks? Because with the amount of raw material, we've, we've, we've basically used twice as many bits to make stuff than we needed. You're, so ne you're never going to become president in America with that attitude. I'm not looking to. I look a bit too Mexican. <laughs> Neil Clifford's totally checked out now. He's just thinking about his DBX 707. No, I think, we, I think we sound like a bunch of guys in the 70s talking about there's no way the CD is going to catch on because it, the vinyl is so much better. Well, it is now. Hmm. 
I actually a DBX seven oh seven. I wouldn't mind one of those. That's that's not that's not a big SUV. That would be perfect no. in London. They, but tell you what, they are so fast. Those things. Lovely yeah. car. Yeah. You need to get to school quickly in London as well. You know, you, you can't do. have something too slow. There's a uh, load of good specs as well for fifty off retail of those. There, yeah, oh, yeah. I love a bit of value. I love yeah. a bit of. He just had to get in there. He had to get in there. Didn't he? Just a little rabbit punch. Yeah. Right on that subject. A, Cull- oh, a Cullinan for 150 grand will all of a sudden look the best looking car on the road. <laughs> but this is a family. This is a family show. Don't swear, Edward. Yeah. Uh, so, I, by the um, way, I've got a very good idea after this conversation, which I will add to our WhatsApp group for a, for an ongoing theme in the future. Nice. Okay. Good. We like ongoing themes. Last Friday, myself and Neil Clifford visited the Crew Bentley factory mm, um, yum, uh, because yum, yum. because we're itinerant and we're lazy and we had nothing. But he said to me, "I've got nothing to do on Friday. Nothing. Let's just do something." Um, uh, that's a lie, by the way. Uh, and um, we wobbled up in a couple of Bentleys, and I was reminded of how much I love the place. It's intoxicating. Like all good car factories, you should leave thinking, why do I not have one? Yeah. I must find a way of owning one. Oh, the sedan. Sedanka. Um, uh, Edward's holding the Sedanka Coupe. So um, my headline uh, for this particular section is as follows. Bentley has always been cooler than Rolls-Royce. I assumed everyone was going to agree. Chris Cooper, before we started, said, but it isn't. So we've got a bit of a problem here. So we'll start with Edward, who I'm hoping will agree with me. Well, as someone who hasn't owned either of these cars, I'm going to change that soon. Neil Neil is definitely the drug dealer amongst us here and is now insisting that we all own a Bentley. So I don't know where I'm going to start. But look at that. Oh, look at that. Look at yeah. that. I yeah. will share a photo of this. This Just is imagine. the Continental T Targa, a Sedanka. Ah, just imagine then, rolling down through the Mont Blanc tunnel, emerging into Italy and spending a week driving around Italy in that, eating great food, getting stopped by the Carabinieri, getting arrested. It'd be brilliant. Yeah. So I, I um, and I wrote down here Continental R, Continental T, Conti T, Le Mans, that 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 era of of cars, and I and that's where I think Rolls Royce clearly is a car originally designed to chauffeur people about. So it's about the back of the car where the Bentley is the driver's choice. It's sort of Mercedes S-Class yeah. versus BMW 7 Club. Series, isn't it? Rolls um, Passenger Club. Yeah. And and I was at the um the auction in London at the weekend and they had the Benja the Benjafield um or the group all gathered together. They were all in there three litre, three and a half litre, four and a half litre Bentleys having a dinner. <laughs> they they rally around the world in these things. Um it's just it's just a fabulous brand, isn't it? And they and the the owners and I'd like to compare them to the Aston Martin owners, but in that actually not com- not compare them because they're the fight, they're fight, the opposite. Fight. They yeah. are they are real addicts. The Bentley lot, they big really time. Are. big time. Yeah, it's really um, funny because I um, is, is Bentley so manage you go then? Is Bentley cooler than Rolls Royce manage? Uh, by miles, and I, I just um, a few years ago I um, I wrote. We were hoping we could make this a film, but I wrote um, a screenplay of the Bentley Boys. Oh, it was about the original time, and I, I spent a bit of time in Cruise, but a lot of time with Richard Charlesworth, who used to um, manage Heritage. I got to meet the 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 Benjafield, um sort of club. We went out, did a lot of, I did a lot of, did a lot of driving in them, and there are a couple of things that really, really. Um, struck my heart. The first thing was the sheer romance of that kind of interwar era. I mean, these guys were fighter pilots who basically found themselves unemployed. And the closest thing you could do was to get into a Bentley. If you look at the grill of a Bentley and a Sopwith Camel, they're not a billion miles apart from that era. And they've yeah. got the leather caps and they have the goggles. Oh, yeah. was that mm-hmm. new one? And, and what really, I, I'll tell you, there was a book I read and I've, I've never... I've never forgotten it. Um, not a lot of people have read this, but I read this cover to cover. It was called The Other Bentley Boys. And what it was about was it was about the mechanics. Oh. And it was about the obsessional detail to which they would go 
when they would build a Bentley. The tolerances were unheard of. They would do things like make sure every screw was lined up so that they were all facing each other. There was a bloke who used to bend the exhaust manifold on a particular tree because he just worked out exactly which branch pulled and how you would do this. They would burnish the things with these Bunsen burners to get the exact right blue. And the thing that really broke my heart, I mean, it was part of the reason why Bentley went broke was because of its after sale service. You didn't take your Bentley to get serviced. They came to your stately own. They bought all the parts that they needed to bring. And if there was a part that had broken, heaven forbid, they'd go and order it from the factory. It would be delivered to your stately home. And this was all on warranty. I mean, these cars were just the best things ever produced. And the thing that broke my heart about the book is it's right at the end. When Rolls-Royce take Bentley over, you should read this mechanic's description of it. He said it was as if there was a level of spite against us that Rolls-Royce had because the way they broke our family, uh, our factory up, the way they scratched things so that they could never, ever be used again. You know, it was an utterly vindictive act of the conqueror. And it is. And in a way, I've never really forgiven Rolls-Royce after reading that because these were men who did so much for cars, so much for Britain. And you want to talk about Tim Birkin, talking about Benjafield. We're talking about Gallup, who turbocharge it and right at the top of that tree is wo himself i mean they did so much and for that company to die the death it did quite so spitefully at the hands of rolls we'll never forgive them rolls royce could sit in the back bentley you definitely sit in the front well I, I didn't know half of that um and i think it's it's interesting when you go to the factory now they've got their sort of presentation area to make you feel good and it does make you feel good the first thing you see ironically enough is a sock with camel engine there's a big like seven liter radial that you see that produces 115 horsepower because WO's first engineering job was to make the sock with camel usable because they kept Absolutely. falling out. They kept falling out of the sky. Um, and if you look at the engineering on that, it's it you know it's just carried out to a higher quality than anything I've seen before from that era. And then you and then you go into this room and they they put it's a really good video show they did, wasn't there, Neil? Which just mm. kind of heart and mouth stuff. You're there thinking, I want one of them, I want one of them, I want one of them. And then it ends, you know, and, and WO's own personal eight liter hard top is there, which he was it was a company car for two years and he used to drive it south of France. So it is it's a special place and the heritage. I mean, I Bentley. I think quite fairly attributes the, the the end of the business under WO to, to add as much to the recession as 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 the cost of the business and the fact that it was not sustainable. But it's a, it's an amazing story. The fact the fact that totally got me back in the day was how short a period of time the legend of the Bentley Boys was built over. Yeah, mm. I thought it was like thirty years. It's no, basically it's five great. or six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nineteen twenty four to nineteen thirty. That's it. Yeah, that's I know. It. I thought it, uh, the way it was written about, I thought it was, you know, it was a decade long phenomenon. It's not at all, is it? Um, no, I, I absolutely love them. Um, Chris Cooper, what do you think? So um, if you ask me which one would I buy, modern, and the picture, Edward, that you showed a minute ago, the Brooklands, I just so want one of those. <clears throat> In oh. fact, one, of, one of the salesmen I was torturing the other week has somewhere down in Kent. I'm going to look at it hopefully next week. Because I really, I th they're just wonderful, and that and that engine uh, is just extraordinary. But the reason I'm I'm naturally contrary and sort of hang on a minute when I'm faced with any assertion that says this is always better than that, this is always right, that's always wrong. My natural contrarian says, really? I'd like to examine that. So I kind of challenge it purely on the base. Precisely because I don't want to be one of those blokes that Neil was talking about earlier down the pub saying, bruh, 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 bruh. you know, we're not sheeple. So I'm naturally contrary. There has been a point when I think Rolls was quite dreary and they they did clearly lose the way. But, you know, you know, Rolls Royce, well, people know, was it 1971, Rolls Royce separated the car company from the aero engine business, which is why the aero is called Rolls Royce Brackets 1971 Limited. New company set up, saved by the government. Oh, the aero engine bit was saved by the by the taxpayer in the seventies. Um, but I'm quite intrigued by 
the work of Torsten Müller Otvos. Talk sensing diff to his mates. Mm. The very recently <laughs> departed. Um, I called him that once. He oh. literally pretended that I wasn't there. Piek. Yeah. No, no, Torsten Müller Otvos. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Uh, the recently retired CEO. I thought it was really funny. I thought I've got to try that. I, I might never. Have you notice that there. we're not falling off our chairs, and that might have been the reaction in the room. I just thought well, you would, wouldn't you? You would. You would. I, I would. I would because I'd be thinking of an Audi ninety Quattro scrabbling for grip on a road. But I but used then to I'm like, sad like you. I used to aspire to the Audi ninety Quattro. But I was a little person in performance car magazine. Ah, oh, cool car. Um, which was we need to talk about triple C at some point as well. Cars and car conversion. Oh yes. Come back to that later. So Torsten Miller Obvos has transformed. I was talking to somebody about this. I probably can't say the business because it's in the public eye at the moment and it's facing a few culture and organizational challenges in very much in the public eye. Um, those people know what I do, Philip will probably work out who it is. But and I use the example of Rolls Royce to say Rolls Royce went from being the passenger's car. Um, there was a brief, brief blip in the 60s and 70s when John Lennon bought a Phantom 5, mm -hmm. painted it all those funny colours, mm -hmm. and then went back to being, it's just the boring, that's the car you buy if you're Jimmy Savile, Gary Glitter, Rolf Harris, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that's going to kill a brand, really, isn't it? But well, then this guy came along, and suddenly it just became... it. Be he and I'm, I, if I get this, if, if I get this wrong, somebody from Rolls will strike a lightning bolt from heaven to excom excommunicate me. But he says, oh, we don't have customers anymore. I mean, this is a bit. We don't have customers. We have patrons of luxury. Oh. I think we've talked about uh, poor sorry. patrons of luxury. How did you manage to say that without vomiting? I, I know I'm a management consultant. Many things are possible. <laughs> Many. Um, but the cars suddenly... What's the McDonald's equivalent of that? You go in, we don't have a hamburger buyer. We have patrons of fine meat or something. Yeah, but I, mean... I think there's a difference between a £2.50 burger and a 2.5 million boat-tailed special edition rolls. So there's something <laughs> you they're just doing now. the gap between the two of them to that. I just think the Phantom 7. Is it Phantom 7 or Phantom 8? Phantom 8 now, isn't it? 8. 8, yeah. That's quite an impressive bit of kit. Oh, it is. There's a lot. Well, they're, they're incredible. So, to draw, they're incredible to be in. They're so just sensational things. If the question is, have they always been cooler? I'm just naturally contrary about that because it forces you to examine. I think there are things about Rolls. Which one would I buy? I'd buy Bentley. <laughs> because <laughs> because I just uh, I have a yearning for that Brooklyn's. Yeah, Neil, oh, Neil Clifford I killed has, myself. Um, with the now, Neil Clifford, and I think he said I coined this phrase, but I'm not sure I did. We we suspect that some of those older Bentleys, and we discussed this last week on our travels, hmm. might be the new Bristols. Not because not because they look like breasts. That's not we're not talking about West Country code here. We're talking about the fact that there's a quirkiness to them. And, but but they're actually brilliant cars to drive on the road. That's what Bristol's were. They were quirky, but they actually did great things on the road. Yeah. And maybe some of the Bentleys produced between 1980 and the late 90s fit that role. And, and Neil, are you going to stand behind that? Yeah, I think um, any any day spent with Chris Harris visiting a car place is wonderful because it's like you're visiting with the Queen. You know, it was really lovely that to get access to all these special places in Bentley, which one could never get. And it was, it was, it was a brilliant day. We had, we had fun, didn't we? Mm. And I think what I wrote down, what Walter, Walter Owen said, Mr. W.O., which is, is the key for me. We will build a fast car, we will build a good car, the best in class. And I think what that says to me and why Bentley, I think Bentley is only cooler to car guys. I think if you went and asked my brothers, two out of three of them are not car guys, one of them is, two of them would say, of course you'd have a Rolls Royce. And I'm not in a position at all to be any in any way negative about Rolls Royce because I think in ultimate luxury brand terms, maybe if you exclude Bugatti, possibly, Rolls would be 
the market research leader globally, if you asked 8 billion people that live on this planet, the number one car brand for luxury, they would say Rolls Royce. Yeah, I think Rolls Royce have equally done a brilliant job, but they, in my view, it's narrow because it's luxury and it's comfort and it's, you know, it's transportation. Bentley does both, in my view. Yeah. The clever bit about Bentley is it does luxury and it's real because whether you sit in a Turbo R or whether you sit in a four litre blower or whether you sit in a new career, um, Continental GT, the quality is amazing of leathers, of switches and all of that stuff. But it's a driver's car. And the tricky bit is doing both. Maybe you could argue it's Aston a bit. Maybe you could argue Bugatti does that. It's very difficult to have two very strong brand attributes at once. And Bentley do do that. That's why yeah. anyone into cars would say Bentley. Anyone that's not into cars yeah. would say Rolls Royce. It was interesting because I think that's probably right. And I was there were people, big Bentley fans and serial buyers who, who are car people um, who wouldn't buy Rolls because of that. Um, when the current CEO took over, uh, Adrian Hallmark, there were, I, I, this is debating the press, I think there were those who thought, will it be, still be the same? Because he's a sales guy, not an engineer. I may have done Mr. Hallmark at service there, but he's not, he wasn't a Durheim or anything like that. Um, but you'd have to say, um, so far, so good. I mean, yeah. we missed the Mulzahn. The Mulzahn is, well, we, it was a one-off. I mean, crikey, how they ever got that through to develop that unique thing. Wonderful. Yeah. And the Brooklyn's before it. So, um, yeah. yeah. As one of the rare idiots that's owned a Phantom 7 and a Mulzahn, <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you how how different about face my ownership experiences was of the two. Because I... I would have thought, despite the fact I'm a Bentley fan, I would have thought that owning a Phantom would be the most special thing I'd ever done. But actually, it was a, it was a letdown, not because I had a bit of a ropey one. It was a letdown because if you scrutinised the car closely, it was less special than you thought. The bodywork, the coachwork was exceptional, the shell was exceptional, but ultimately it was just a 760 engine in there. There was a, It was very obvious what the BMW bits were. Yeah. A lot of the switch gear and stuff you could tell was BMW. Whereas the Bentley particularly the you know the Mulzahn you couldn't you know there was okay some of the screen the central screen was a bit VW but then nothing else was and, mm. the, and at the heart of it was this engine there was an engine that so perfectly fitted the personality yeah. of the car yeah. and whereas the whereas the Phantom's engine you did just think oh this is a actually I've just got a BMW in here and you were always aware of it I don't know why you were always aware of it whereas the Bentley just felt like it had this me sort of me method of propulsion that was from a different planet it was that engine is extraordinary yeah, Does yeah. that? I, I was going to ask that in terms of engines and Bentleys, given the variety of engines that are available in the more modern Bentleys, tell me how much that matters on the more modern Bentleys. W12, V8S, V6 hybrid. If they do a if they do a sporty one, uh, GT3R, for example, then the V8, which is you know very closely related to the RS6 engine, works. But in every any other application. You can kid yourself that the V8 is enough. It's not because then you drive no. the W12, and then you the moment you start it, and it does, it's got a different starter motor sound, that slightly higher pitched mm. word that you get from a from a supercar, and it and it fires, and there's this very expensive noise, and then it settles, and once it settles, and the exhausts are hot and cold, sorry, and it's a bit noisier, you go, I need that one. Yeah, you just, <laughs> you, you, I'm yeah. sorry, you do. And if you know if you're gonna if you're gonna do something stupid, you might as well do it. Properly stupid. Yeah. <laughs> the V6 hybrid is same as in the Porsche products or any it's a really it's the worst of two poor answers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. Right, moving on. Um, Interesting. um now this is um but this is a very serious subject. I'm gonna ask my fellow podcasters. <laughs> when you go to service station on the motorway, normally motorway. But this this is a can of worms for Neil Clifford now because he's going to have a nervous breakdown about the quality of service stations. We actually I went to a service station with Neil Clifford last week, the first time. I should talk about that. Um, and um, what do you? What's your preferred drink confectionery combo and why? It could be. It doesn't have to be confectionery. It could be. It could be any kind of comestible. Okay. It could and they could be cheesy. Uh, but it's up to you. So Edward, love it. You stop at a service station. What's your go to? 
Um, well, I've been, I have been a little off colour this week, so I haven't had a lot of time to think in detail about this. But uh, uh, as a boy, it would have been a Lucasade. I, I like ah. a like an, a, an original Lucasade. Great drink. And, and it would have always been some sort of chewy sweet. <laughs> Yeah, um, but prob- probably something like a frutella or, a, oh, or a strawberry Starburst frutellas, strawberry or, frutellas. Or a, yeah, or a Starburst or something like that. But as as a slightly older individual now, uh, it's only water. Um, I won't. I don't like to drink coffee in the car, so I'd have the coffee before. If I need a coffee, I'd have it between getting in and out. And is that because you might need to go to the loo? Does it? No, it no, adapt- no, no, not not at all. I just don't. I just don't want a hot drink in the car. Um, and I, I'd also, I wouldn't, if I needed a coffee, I wouldn't have a shit coffee. So it would have to be a coffee, uh, that's good Sounds enough. Sounds like good Robert, consumer advice. I would, don't have a shit I would dodge, I would dodge a Costa, but I would actually happily have a McDonald's coffee because the McDonald's coffee, I would say is better than a, than a Costa coffee. Um, right. so what waters the drink for the car, probably an Evian, um, with, with a flip off top. I don't want a screw top. <laughs> I just want to be able to grab it and and squeeze. Um, and then the confectionery, it's going to be whatever is the sourest sweet possible I can find on the shelves uh, at the time, which the go-to would be a Tang Fast stick. I think it's quite, it's a, there's generally something quite good. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have the, I'd leave the gooey ones, the ones that are half tangy on the top and spongy at the bottom. I'd give yeah, those to the right. kids or my wife. But I'd normally the cherries are the cherries are my favourite within the tang fastics. And if I've got if I've got it in me to get something else, because you did only say one, I'd probably have the crispiest salt and vinegar crisp I can find. Probably a grab bag because a small bag's not enough. Um, because yeah. my wife, although she says she doesn't want any crisps, when I open them, she will want some. So, uh, and the kids will want them. So I have to get them a bag. So yeah. something slightly okay. larger, crispy as possible, extra crunchy, salt and vinegar. Um, and just to answer the what can't you have, I do not allow cheese and onion crisps in the car because that is the most antisocial statement. And Whilst trying to grow collecting cars, I have told everybody in the office that you are not allowed a cheese and onion crisp in the office. Now, the first 10 employees found that very serious and they abided by that rule. I've struggled to uh, um, assert my authority as we've grown as a business. And I see cheese and chive Pringles. I see what sits, all sorts of things in the office. They normally get fired immediately, dependent on the mood of HR during the day. But I have also realized that my authority over my children and wife is also not working because the cheese and onion crisp has made it into the car yeah. on extended journeys, uh, uh, which infuriates me. I is think you've chosen the wrong answer? hill. I think you've chosen the wrong hill to die on there. Although I do think, because <laughs> isn't the egg sandwich? Oh, doesn't that trump the so oh, to speak? Oh yeah, but we don't. If, you don't even raise that because if you raise it, then something that's no one's even considered buying. They're all going to. Daddy yeah. says we can't have an egg sandwich, so oh, maybe we should get an egg sandwich. That's but that, true. That, that, yeah. We don't even talk about the egg sandwich. Yeah, I, I think I'm with you that. I'm with you. That <laughs> I think. Um... I thought I want to hear Chris Cooper. That was very comprehensive, Edward. You've thought about that. Very impressive. A lot of head nodding from a lot of people agreeing with you. Chris Cooper, what do you buy? What do you not buy? Well, it, it, if I think back, we, we did confect car confectionery before. But one of my thinking about the Lucasade, which that little sign on the M4, when you used to drive in on the elevator section of the M4, past the old Beecham's building, Mm-hmm. And it had one of those old-fashioned neon signs of a little glug, 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 fizz, 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 with the Lucasade bubbles. It and it said in that this beautiful neon sort of long joined-up handwriting, Lucasade AIDS recovery. So I'm sorry, if you just told us, Edward, we could have sent around some soothing restorative Lucasade, not that fancy modern sports stuff, but the original slightly yeah. syrupy, sticky one. Oh, oh it's a you, great you've drink. Got, you've got to have the original one, yeah. The original, and it's got to be cold. Right. If it's not absolutely bone cold, it's difficult. Agreed. That is true. Agreed. That's my one yeah. of my abiding memories of childhood. I remember the day I heard Graham Hill had died in his air crash. 
I was home from school navigating the sticky <sighs> bottle of that syrupy, sticky Lucasade bottle. Wow. Thinking that's it. I'll always remember that day. But I think, and so apart from when you used to be able to get boxes of Smarties, not the little tube, but a yeah, box yeah. of Smarties that would fit into the little sort of thing ah. in the door pocket. Because it was just the right size. You could just, you know, you could navigate your hand down, find where the box was, and delve into that slightly waxy paper they had. That was, was that a little, a little, it was a little box. It wasn't massive, yeah. It was sort oh, of. No, no, um, they did the big boxes bigger. The big yeah, box. They did yeah, big boxes big as well, box. didn't they? Yeah. Um, and because it was a box you had to delve into, nobody would really ask for any because you have to sort of rummage around your own fingers. But I think on service station food, I went to the Gloucester services for the first time. You did. Oh. And I think I texted you guys to say... Yeah. Did you take a suitcase of money with you? It takes a lot of money. It's very, very busy. Lots so, of pumpkins as well. Um, I, I stopped at the place sort of the, where you, you, you tap in your, your orders. That's the thing I wanted to have a go about. What's happened? I bet a bloody management consultant has done this. You. Who's broken McDonald's? <laughs> Who's broken McDonald's? In the old days, you could go up to McDonald's, you go to the counter, look at the menu if you really needed to, and say, I'll have a Big Mac or a double quarter pounder and cheese. And they'd reach behind it, bottle of the rack behind them, bring it down, put your mind down, and bosh, you're good. Now, now, you've got to go in and do oh, some touch screen. Touch screen doesn't work. Go in front of Takes about 10 minutes. I know. Know, that, but that's your time, not theirs. No. That's, that's his dumbness. It's just not custom. I mean, anyway, I've got What's this. your confectionery choice? So the food choice, <laughs> I, I had a, I had two of those lovely and delicious ham and toasted sandwiches oh. from the takeaway place. Gloss over. In fact, it looked so nice. I ordered one. I was waiting. I thought, Do you know what? They look really nice. I'm not sure one's enough, so I had two. So no. I texted you guys, say, what can I get you? And I think the soup manish you wanted wasn't available. Uh, but the scotch egg was. So I bought Neil, thinking, I'm going to be home tomorrow. I'll get him a scotch egg. But in the inimitable style and substance of Forrest Gump, I had to text later to say, I ate some <laughs> of his scotch egg. So I'm sorry, the scotch egg didn't make it back to Buckinghamshire. Neil so, Clifford, do you, do you allow yourself to eat in the car? I'm not sure you're someone who does. Um, oh, I so thought this is a really complicated one, isn't it? I would drive as, and by the way, my wife's favourite sandwich is an egg sandwich, so she'll be feeling very upset about that, but she only eats half, and then I get half an egg sandwich that sits in the car for about two days. Oh. The, the I will drive to the nth degree to find a petrol station which has got an M&S. Yeah. yeah. Because they are by far the best places to go and get something to eat. And I will run it down almost to zero, hoping that wherever I am on the M bloody six, that the next one has got an M&S in it. Because I do have, as you, everyone knows, quite a problem with our quality of our service stations. Yeah. To Neil, the flip side to that is if you can't get an M&S, what makes you shudder the most? A spa, a budgeons, or like... An unbranded, unbranded one effort. I it's wouldn't the, even go in the others. <laughs> yeah, it's the unbrand. I mean, if I'm in one that's not an M and S, that, and I'm normally on a big journey somewhere or trying to sort of go somewhere too far away, I would have the big bag of wheat crunchies. I would go wheat crunchy because actually it's the only place you can find wheat crunchies. Really, what's the okay. sauce? What flavour are we going? What's um, the sauce? bacon? Bacon, okay, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. excellent. It's only bacon. Excellent crisp, that. Excellent yeah, but crisp. also the bacon wheat crunchy is variable. Sometimes they're not strong enough. Sometimes you get a wheat yeah, they crunch. Are, yeah. It's very a bit too corny. Because to the other two, as we know, are spicy tomato and Worcester sauce. But it's very difficult. Or I think probably they've discontinued Worcester sauce. Yeah. Worcester sauce or however you suggest it. Um, so I would, go, I would go big bag of wheat crunchy, share it with the wife. And my drink... Edward is dead right on many of the things that he said. But if I'm not going Evian, I'm going Red Bull. Yeah. Ooh, that's yeah. a Chris Cooper move, that. Yeah. Red Bull, in a way, is the new Lucasade. I know Lucasade. Lucasade for me was always about energy, not about making me better. Um, and Red Bull own, you know, to the to probably to the disgust of Coca-Cola, because there was a period where you bought a Coke for a bit of energy. Red Bull totally owns. I need a bit of a perk up. It certainly yeah. works better than coffee. And I are you would... doing full fat? Um, what, Red Bull? No, sugar-free. 
Sugar free. The light blue oh. one. The light okay. blue one. And a small one. Because it's the all you need, actually. Classic if for you, me. If you've, got to, if you've got to do another couple of hundred miles, a double espresso won't do you. But a Red Bull does do you. It works. Yeah. yeah. It does work. Manish, what are you taking from the service station? Well, we've got a big thing. I just don't like any eating in the car of anything. Crisps just leave bits of crisp. Yeah. And that just drives me that. Whether it's on a carpet or on a seat, we just don't do it. Um, it's only an Audi event, Manish. I wouldn't worry too much. Right. Bloody immaculate inside. It smells only? like a car from 2000, 2007 July is what you smell when you open that car door. I can tell you that now. Um, so I actually orange tic tac, yeah, oh, not I available in the UK, still not available in the not UK anymore. No, not for a while, not anymore. But that is my P1. Um, opal fruits bracket strawberry, I just love those, absolutely love those. Um, and for the drink, it would have to be not the new because they only have 63 calories, but the old 300 calorie Fanta, right? Uh, it's just a killer drink, orange. Yeah, orange. I mean, it's primal, it's wonderful. You know, if you put a tooth in that, I bet it would rot it faster than yeah. the coke. <laughs> <laughs> what was the um what what was the not wine gums? What what were the harder um American um, spangles. spangles? No, 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 no. They were they came in a tubular thing, but it, they were they were firmer and always got stuck in your American, teeth. American American hard gums. Yeah, gums. they're hard gums, are they? Hard yeah, gums. or fruit gums. It's a fruit, fruit gums, gum. fruit gums, fruit gums. Yeah, I had a discovery this week. I was I had to go to Blackpool this week, and I got there very very late on the Sunday night, and stayed in a hotel that was part of a football stadium. It's bizarre. AFC Fylde actually it was quite an interesting place, and the bloke in the hotel said he was a night manager, and when I got in there, he said, uh, "Oh, room seven. Amanda Holden stayed in that room last week. You're very lucky, sir." So I sort of took my good fortune to the petrol station down the road. So I was looking for some evening comestibles. And they didn't have Maynard's natural colours and flavours wine gums. They had yeah, a spa, a yeah. spa substitute. And I thought, well, it's out or nothing. I'll have to have the spa ones in. They were really nice. They had just were a they? bit, they were a bit more unctuous. Bit more Did they have a bit more unctuous. melted animal bone in them. Probably, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. 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 So now I understand why you sent me a photograph of you licking a toilet seat in a hotel. <laughs> that makes all makes perfect sense now. No, that was her. That was her <laughs> doing that. I find that quite often my con I mean, I, I've I've had to live in cars for twenty years, so I'm always eating in cars. There's no rules. I'll eat anything in a car. I'll eat a quiche. I'll eat a sausage roll without it out of a bag. I don't give a shit. I'm in there to work. I've got to eat. I don't care. I'll hoover it out afterwards. Um, but my my choices definitely. I find myself adjusting choices according to the car that I'm driving. So, for example, when I had an Elise day to day, I remember that the only chocolate bar that really fitted sensibly in that little leather flap on the side mm. of the gear lever. Mm was double decker because you could allow the new guy just to soften a bit against it. Whereas if you had a crunchy, <laughs> it would crack. The Snickers would go into some kind of fit and would never be the right shape afterwards. But double decker was the bar. So there was always a bar that fitted the car. Um, <laughs> drinks wise, definitely Lucas Man default. I used to love a can of Lilt. Lilt's now disappeared, but I think Lilt was, yeah. a, was a good nice. soft drink. Yeah, and I always prefer tins to bottles because we know that the plastic bottle drink is... Is the worst way to contain that liquid because the bubbles are too big. It doesn't taste good. Coca-Cola in a plastic bottle is shite. Coca-Cola in a tin or a glass bottle yeah. is one. But I'll tell you one drinks choice I made last year in service stations. It was entirely due to the car was, I've always loved a Capri Sun. So anyone that everyone knows, if, if they've been in a car after me, there'll often be an orange Capri Sun in there because I think it's a, it's a good drink. But in the 992 Touring that I had, that cup holder pissed me off so oh. much but I would always buy a Capri your elbow. I could put a Capri Sun on the passenger seat next to me and not have to deal with that infernal fucking cup holder right <laughs> in front of the gear lever. Yeah. It's still the worst piece of design ever. Yeah. So for me, Capri Sun, cheeky chocky bar, that does me fine. Yeah. The, the oh, double decker. The double decker. The, isn't the double decker a bit like a bimetallic strip? That when it heats up, it sort of heats up more than one side. So it ends up oh, a yeah. bit... Yes. Curvy. It's it, lovely, it, though. It's, it's elasticity 
alters side to side. Differential. Also, it's got, it gives you the, the double decker gives you a lot of potential eating options. You can either go in I agree. and take nougat and crunch crisp together, yeah, or you I agree can take the top off it first, like a top off. Yeah. There's a lot you. I mean, there's an awful lot you can do with a double decker. It's yeah. very. You know, do you it's not the, feel the Twix? The Twix gives you all of those variations as well. No, because you, you can't really take the top off a of Twix. Oh, and also, the, the caramel on the top of the Twix is gone too easily. The nougat really fights back. I mean, you've got a battle on your hands there. You've got to work. You have to strategize with a double decker, whereas yeah. with a Twix, it's just done. You need a, I think you as need we a go deeper into yeah. as we go deeper into winter, and we need to remind ourselves of the summer months. I think next week we need to talk about ice cream in the car because uh, oh, just, oh, just, to, just to reflect also, on the summer months. Right, we'll I'm going to move this on because I'm going to move this on because I've got to drive to Leeds. Stop talking, Edward. Right, here we go. Um, what's your favourite button in a car? And don't say Jensen because we might love him, but it's not a funny joke, Chris. I know you were going to say that. No. no. <laughs> Manish, what's your favourite button in a car? What are you showing us there? Do you know what this is? That looks like a golf to me. Not quite. Looks what like something it? Italian. It is, it is. It's a Fiat X19. Oh, nice. And, um, nice car. Oh, it's a, my friend Dan had one. And uh, another friend of mine, Stephanie, who's half Italian, had one. And they've got that little bit in the middle that just looks, I'm quite into myself, chocolate bar citron seats and it's just it's great it's just a hazard button on this there are just yes. little, if you just look again it's little two little clusters of yes four yes four yeah just yeah. Really, plastic has never been so sexy so delicious that plastic panel it's just great it's an inverted pyramid and they've managed to get eight buttons on of which really only four are buttons the other four are sort of false fronts it's just it's fabulous Fiat X19 hazard light button. Like it. You, you don't get that kind of geeker in any other podcast. Well done, man. Just pat yourself on the back. No, well, thank you. I really struggled to decide and, and and because I thought it was the 928 central locking button, <laughs> which is that red glowing lamp almost with the little key on it in the middle of the dash. But actually, I decided the reason why I like that is not really the button itself. It's the noise that it made. It's just, it's incredible. It's German engineering at its best. It sounds like a door of a prison closing. It's so <laughs> authoritative, that noise. So even though I, it's really in my top five of buttons, the one and the only one is the air conditioning button on a 1990s BMW. The blue, not only did you look into a car and think, has he done the air conditioning option? Yeah. We know How to, wealthy is he? How wealthy is he? Okay, he's got rear head restraints, but they were only 300 quid, but the air conditioning yeah. is 2,200 pounds. Proper wealth. On a 19,000 pounds BMW, yeah. for God's sake. And then when you managed over years to find the struggle in life to get a car with that button, the colour... When you switch that on, you press that little button and the blue, that bright cobalt blue glow, when you press that button, that's that for me nails every other button. And also the earlier ones in the 80s, late 80s, it wasn't the whole button that lit up. It was just the square oh, that in, the middle. in the middle. Yes. It had a little glow in the middle because the bulb yeah. wasn't quite yeah. perfect. So yeah. right in the middle of the button. Yeah. That, easy for me, that one, really. Okay. Oh, there were there are two for me. They're a bit random. One is um, I loved I love the button that did the sports exhaust or operated sports exhaust on a Gen One nine nine six nine nine seven GT three. It was um that yeah. they, that switch gear looks really old now because yeah. the, the facelift cars with the three point eight had much cooler sat bigger sat nav and everything. But there was a button that it moved. It was hinged top to bottom. And it had a sort of chin that came out of the bottom of the button. And, the, yeah. and every time you got in the car, you press this button. And it was the first generation of GT3 that really, the exhaust button made a big difference. It was like, wow. And I used, it was the first time I really got into a car and I almost couldn't bring myself to start it unless this button was on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just, I love the way that button felt. It had a great movement on it. It never, it never went, it never, that movement never deteriorated. It was of high quality. It was German. I love yeah. that one. 
And the other one for me was M it was late eighties BMWs when you used to get in it and you had the airlines aircraft style yeah. button at the top. It was just set to basically casually turning to your to your fellow BMW passengers and just going, I'll just clear that. Just pressing the <laughs> clear check. I'm just checking. Clear master. We all alarm. thought we were pilots. Just casually yeah. going, the lights all came on. Free drive checks are completed and clear. Away we go. <laughs> Um, it's always bad when a, when a one stayed on though, because the rear brake light. Was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Service. Well, I used to love just casually going and clear pre check pre pre drive tracks completed. Um, yeah. But for me, it's it's that nine nine seven. Strangely, that nine nine seven exhaust button is one that really sticks with me. Ed would love it. Um, is a knob a button? No, oh, I God. said that oh. in the description. No, but hold on a second. If you compress the knob. Fuck's sake, Edward. The reason I put that is because You're gonna I think it's a choke, isn't it? Yeah. No, 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 no. It's no, it's oh, not. Keep I, going. The, the volume knob stroke, but I want to be able to turn my volume up now. But I also want to just be able to press the button to turn yeah. it off. On what card? Um, I like that. Well, that's where I unfortunately, because I have been a little off colour, uh, I haven't gone Probably. into full apart from sweeties and drinks. Clearly, <laughs> I, I haven't thought about this enough, so I, I haven't been as specific. So I will come back to you on this. But Z8 starter button. Yeah. Yeah. No. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Red. Yeah. The plastic red. I'm just going to read you something, Edward. What is your single favourite button in any car? One button, not a dial or a switch. Full stop. A button. Yeah, but if you can press not, the knob in, I don't want to look. I, to, honestly, I don't want to see you aggressively. Well. I don't want to see you aggressively fingering on this podcast. It's it's not needed. Okay, right, Neil oh. Clifford, you've done yours. Oh, oh, so can I just Cooper. do? Can I do? Yeah. What, can I do one more? This is uh, this is just a, a mechanism more than anything. So this might be different, but electrically deployable tow bar i don't even if if i i don't need to need a tow bar but seeing the tow bar sort of reveal itself by pressing the button is quite an exciting thing you reveal <laughs> something about yourself as well yes you i, um, I agree right are, I love um, tow. okay uh, there's only one <laughs> Go on. do you tow there's only one it's the power button on an e60 m5 oh, oh. what well, you went from 400 to 500 didn't you it's, oh. I mean, it's an amazing, I mean, I had, I had one of the very first E60 M5s and I'd seen all the thing about there's a power button, it's about 400 something to 500 something. It did make a difference. I mean, I mean, well, <laughs> no shit, but it was just such a cool thing to say. And you would say a bit like, pre-flight check's done. And I would say to people, okay, um, we're in standard mode now. Um, the road's about to clear. Would everybody be okay if I press the power button? Yeah, I think we can make that... more progress. Everybody okay with that? About to throttle up. I mean, how cool is that? How cool is that? And I remember saying to you at the time, because it must have been, it was after we'd done the Nürburgring, the Caterham race, before we decided doing it. And I had an M6, yeah, um, that generation power button as well. I'm saying to you, did anybody, when you were in the trade dailies or trade weeklies trade, did anybody take performance figures from an M5 or an M6 with the power button in the, you know, peacetime? No, we mode, never did. We should have done. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite a, a like... difficult decision on when to deploy the button, though. That's what I struggle well, with. Well, I, I think it's either, you know, I think you have to ask your passengers. And I think you can also say it's a bit like the power settings on GT3 cars. Remember that Bentley we had? Had, like, a number of different maps on it. And DEFCON 1... Map one, I used to call that's the wartime setting. <laughs> so the 400 horsepower, I think you can call it the peacetime setting. But when the road clears, the horizon stretches, everybody okay? <laughs> Did you, it's um, wartime. Do you remember, do you remember in the, the, the mid to late 80s, the, um, the Williams of Mansell and PK had their boost? And it was just yeah, absolutely yeah, that's quite crazy. common in Formula race cars It was now. the DRS of its time. Yeah. Those yeah. two yeah. cars, they would just go up behind somebody, and PK would say, "I pressed the thing, I got into the corner first, and I opened the legs," which is what he called. <laughs> he would say that. Into a nine three five and see that massive boost. So there's a red thing that big in a nine three five, which is boost. Yeah. We'd manually crank it up. <laughs> um, um, the only other one I've got very quickly, my little mini Magic when it was first built, 
um, the horn button. You had to press the horn button itself because you went through at a very, very quick left-hand corner. As the car leaned over, the horn would start tooting in this rather joint plative way. I've had that. If you press the button, it would stop tooting the horn. So the horn button, if I couldn't have the power button on an E60 M5, I'd have the little tooty-wooty horn button on my Magic Mini. I think we've definitely not answered any of the questions that were asked, but that's about standard on this podcast. <laughs> two-car garage, the two-car garage for today. Here we go. Um, you're a Formula One driver of the this day. This is from one of our listeners, isn't it? It is, yes. It's from a listener called, I'll get his name up in a minute. Can someone find the name of the listener while I'm doing this? Um, yes. You're a Formula One driver of the day at the top of his game, and you're heading to Europe for the summer break. For your first car, you've agreed to meet your F1 driver colleagues to compare your set of wheels. The unintended aim is to impress the rest, and because of your F1 status and influence, any and all manufacturers can provide you with any one of their street legal cars. The second car is the one you've always wanted and would never consider selling. A car that would make you forget about attending another boring event with your manager or the missus because you unintentionally walked into your garage, saw the car, and took it out for a spin instead. And after returning, all you had to do was name the car and where you've been, and they would simply understand and say, yeah, all right, seems fair enough. So we've got effectively a manufacturer's car, and then you've got your kind of hero car. Um, he says. So I'll go to Manish first. Well, because it's, it's a contemporary driver, I, I thought of just three people. I thought it would either be Lewis or Max, or last year it would have been Vettel. And so I think when you talk about manufacturer cars, I think you're down then to each one's hypercar. And I think if it was Max, it would probably be the Valkyrie, the V2 or whatever they call it, VP2, is it? But he, might um, have a he might have a development one, but yeah, it's the yeah. Valkyrie is what it's called. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, it's just an insane, it's an insane car. And actually, Chris Harris and I know someone with one of these, and I've certainly seen you chuck one of these things around a little bit on a track, maybe. And mm -hmm. um, I think if it was Lewis, he'd have the Mercedes equivalent. Well, it's the Mercedes one, isn't it? AMG one. Yeah, he might not make it so, to the meetup in there. I don't think he would. You don't think so? If he, well, he just might not make it. Show off, if he wants to turn up and show off in his Mercedes colours, he'd have an IWC watch on, he'd turn up with his corporate car. And I think that, that I think those two would probably be the biggest kind of fuck off cars that you could take to a track just to sort of say, look, I drive for this firm. They don't make anything quicker. But I think the second part of the challenge is much more difficult. Um, what sort of taste do these people have? Do they really, you know, are they so passionate about something maybe in the past are they so romantic about something in the past? Because I've got this theory that all Formula One drivers, whether they admit to it or not, would like to drive for Ferrari. Now, whether that is going to work out in terms of furthering your career or not, you know, you only had to look at Paul Leclerc over the weekend to know what a poison chalice that can be. But in terms of owning a car when you're not in your kind of branded Mercedes or uh, or Red Bull gear, I think you would want to own a Ferrari. And I think you'd want to own probably the best racing Ferrari that you could get for the road. And I think it would be a 250 GTO. I think that's what you'd have. You have that kind of money. I think that's it. Edward, you were saying that there's one on sale or it's gone, has it, this week? For it, 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 it wasn't born as a 250 GTO, but uh, right. it looks like one now. Yeah. So the, little, the little, um, but the quirk I'd have, I think it probably actually, maybe even go for the 250 LM, just because it's a little mm, bit. That's nice. Nice. You know, they are, one they the are. One. That's one of the coolest things I've ever driven. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think Thank that's you what you would do. It. And, and and I I can see him having in that garage and whether, you know, if you live in Monaco and that's in your garage, I can see that you could go anywhere for half a day and back you come. And so I a, think two, a 250 LM. Yeah. 
Not the ugly cross-eyed one, the 275. Yeah, not the not the 275, which I don't think is either ugly or cross-eyed. You had a go at my sausage guy earlier on. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bill I'm sorry. Clifford, Bill Clifford, I know, this, I, I know this was... I know this was... Too, I know this was too, uh, the irony is, Neil, Neil said this is too long, this one, but I've got ones that he wrote for us that were about three times longer. <laughs> so um, what have you, got, have you got an answer to this for us? Yes, I don't struggle with writing shit. It's reading shit I struggle with. <laughs> The, um, okay, so uh, in my little imagination, and I, th there wasn't a date on this. It didn't say it had to be current. No, um, no. But, no. But I haven't gone back to the good old days completely. I've gone to the coolest, one of the coolest Ferrari drivers for me, because I'm choosing a Ferrari as the first car, is Eddie Irvine. I just think, you know, whether he won loads or what, or, he was just a cool dude. He was a guy from Ireland racing for Ferrari. I mean, good looking lad. I reckon he had a life that we would all have loved to have had. He's still, he's still got exactly the same life. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he's just mega, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be rocking up. And I, then I jump forward to today uh, slightly. I wouldn't be rocking up in my project one. I'm a 918 or my stupid mission X which, of course, the judgment of the Mission X at the moment is, when do you get the call from the dealer? Are you rich enough to be on their top list? Or when you get the call in a month's time, you clearly realise that the, their really VIP customers have said, no, I do not want a £2 million electric car. Thank you very much. So I'm waiting for the call. Anyway, I'm not on the top list because I know many people that have had the call already. Well, we'll get back to the list. I'm not, I'm not rocking up in a 918 or a Project One. I'm I'm going cool. I'm going classic. It's much cooler than just going for current. So, of course, I'm going for the best-looking Ferrari that's ever probably been built, which is the Ferrari 275. <laughs> <laughs> Ferrari 275C Competizione, six carbs, Beautiful thing. I'm being lent by Ferrari from the museum. It's in a lovely navy blue. It's got a lovely cognac tan as opposed to cognac red. Very different in terms of like looking. that. 275. And every all the other drivers are going to be pissed off because they've turned up in all these horrible modern things. And I've got the coolest thing. The second car is, and this was very easy for me to decide, it's a Bentley blower. It's a Bentley blower from 1928. And it's very easy to explain to the wife or whatever the thing said, why didn't you turn up to the, the dinner tonight, darling? Oh, I took my 1929 Bentley blower, which of course the blower never won them all actually. So it's the, th it's the, it's the three litre or the four and a half litre. And I drove to Mount Street because there's a wonderful photo that we'll all put up when all those amazing dudes of um, Birkin and Bernardo and all the other Bentley boys. Benjafield and Kidston. Yeah, they, they all, they went and won Le Mans. They drove the car straight back and they parked at Mount Street Gardens for a photo. And then they probably went out and got pissed. <laughs> so I, I, I would be driving my Bentley blower to Mount Street Gardens, parking it up, having a little espresso, and my wife would be very happy that I didn't attend the event because she knows how important that is for me. Yeah. And if she, and she would know that if you took her to Mount Street, you might end up on the pavement just gently throttling around the throat as well, because that happens a lot on Mount Street, doesn't it? Go, go and have the Indian food at Jamava on Mount Street. That yeah. only, only if you're wearing a Patek. Yeah. Uh, Chris Cooper, what's your two-car garage? So um, most Formula One drivers are by definition competitive and they're sort of the younger ones. They're all, they're all they, they, they'd make a race out of anything, you know, finding the best seat at the bar, whatever. So if the ultimate competition would be, what would the car that, you know, question said from our uh, the learned listener, what would the, from a, a new car from a manufacturer? You better think, not have mine, Chris. <laughs> take that. Ah, oh, that, that's a cool car. That's a cool well, car. Hennessy. It's a Hennessy, Hennessy Venom F5. Um, Brocia says it does 301 miles an hour. It's got a V8 engine. It's called a Fury engine, 1,603,000 horsepower. So if you're an F1 driver, you want to shut them all up to say, I've won this race, I've won this game, you take one of those. Hmm. The other car, though. It's the wrong answer, but well done. 
the 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 answer to the other part is it's nine eleven k. It's tucked till nine eleven k. Yeah, and you would I because I think our listener asked us to name the road. I'd want to drive it on the road from Oban to Glencoe, west coast of Scotland. Lovely. It's just lovely. So the the one you'd have just to say everyone understand. Richard Tuttle's nine eleven k, Oban to Glencoe. Um, interesting. So is Edward. So, Chris was on the right tracks to say that the, the, there's there's a lot of ego that charges these Formula One guys. They they want to win, and you know, Manish went supercar. But to be honest, you Manish, those cars that you mentioned, they're kind of the obvious choices. They'd get them anyway. They probably don't need to pay for them. They're part of the contract. But I think at the moment, the ultimate fuck you car to turn up in would be a Ferrari SP3 because they're all going to think, how'd you get one of those? How'd you get an allocation? Yeah. One of those I asked, I'm trying to pull all the favours. How did you get one? And you got it in that special one-off colour. So I think, S <laughs> so we've turned up, and it did say Europe here. So we've turned up at Andermatt at the Chedi. And uh, my SP3, I turn up, you can hear it roaring across one of the passes. And they're like, ah. Oh. I bought. I got a Veyron. I put. I got the the. Oh, sorry, Chiron Super Sport lent to me. I came in my Valkyrie. But the guy in the SP3, they're like, "How did you get an allocation for that?" And then the other car where I'm going to go across the Furka, the Saint Gotthard Pass. It, there's a loop that you can do around there and come back down to uh, Andermatt. I did put 991 Speedster. And then halfway through this, I did write 911K, but I can't have the same answer as you, Chris. So, Good answer. Yeah, and it's a very good speedster. answer. It's a very good answer. I, I think I would have a an original 2.8 RSR to Lovely. do that Ooh. trip. And, and I think yeah. they would understand when I park that yeah. car back and it's ticking itself away that they'd be like... I get it. You need it. You needed a few hours to yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's the, all of these are very good, actually. I, I'm, I'm going to compliment my fellow podcasters. Right. For me, I've gone back to 1992. Um, my favourite, I think he is my favourite F1 driver anyway, but my favourite F1 driver with product endorsements is Nigel Mansell because the photograph of him with his F40 is the coolest F1 yeah. driver with his company car photo ever. So it all comes back to Nigel. But Nigel's is at Renault, and Renault's got this car called a Clio 60 valve. My nose is running. Sorry, horrific here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nigel is Nige is um, he's involved with Renault. It's not gone south just yet, and they've said to him next year, Nigel, we're going to have a special Renault Clio <coughs> called a Williams, and he loves it. He's gone. This is great. So they've turned up to their meeting, and Nigel has turned up wearing a flat cap in a development Clio Williams. And he's won, because everyone's going, God, I want one of those. That's a yeah. brilliant car. Wish I could have one of those. So he does his thing, but then a transporter arrives, <coughs> and on it is Nigel's relaxation car, his, his Haven. And it is, it's quite a special thing. It's a Rosso Dino, so that orange-red, it's a Daytona with a plexiglass front, so it's got the open lights. It's got power steering from the, from the GTC, because Nigel's not an idiot, he doesn't want to break his shoulders. And it's just got a lovely light brown interior, and he gets into it and drives off, and everyone just goes, we all, thought, we all thought he wasn't the coolest F1 driver, but really he is. He is. Clio, Clio Williams, development car, and a Rosso Dino plexiglass Daytona yeah. with power steering. And where is he driving to? It's quite simple. He's actually up in Northern Europe because he's driving on the road between Gerolstein and the Nürburgring, which is one of the great roads ever. That is a great road. That's a great road. Yeah, I'll give you so, that. That is um, the best fantasy Nigel Mansell I have ever heard. <laughs> that person just doesn't exist. It they is, that is nice. And they will never exist. Oh. Rosso I love it. Daytona. That, photo, that photo of him with the F40 remains the best product endorsement photograph yeah. ever. He had a dealership, didn't he? Nigel Mansell Sports yes, Car down in Blanford. Yes, it was the modestly named Nigel Mansell Sports Cars yeah. down, in, uh, down in Dorset. <laughs> Blanford, but, um, yeah. No, he, he's a legend. Okay, right. Um, Manish wants to squeeze a bit of music in. We're going to let him do that. Then I've got to go because I've got two minutes left on my extension on my room. Otherwise, I have to pay another £20. Pounds. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. So get into your car, put on Mozart's clarinet concerto, the second movement. It's K622. 
it's beautiful and it's autumn in a car there you go autumn in a car neil clifford got any music you want to share or not I'm off to America next week, so I'm back on my American music. James Taylor, Carolina, On Your Mind. Oh, Wonderful. On my song. Yeah. I would love it. You've not thought about music at all, have you? No, I have. This one, this one's kicking off. A bit of EDM for you. The, uh, the DJ is called Zerb, and the song is called Macawi. M-W-A-K-I. You're going to like this when we put this out. You're laughing, Manish. It might not be a bit of classical, but this 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 is cool. This is going to go down well in the comments. Oh, wait to get some like it. it's like got it. it's got a Kenyan Kenyan backing singer, so Kenyan uh, I'm soundtrack. I'm in. Um, Chris Cooper. And um, when we talked last week about Henry Mancini, and I said he played for Queen's Park Rangers, I was, of course, referring to Terry Mancini. He's a lesser-known brother. What I hadn't remembered, I, shameful because I'm an Arsenal supporter, is that Terry Mancini also played for Arsenal after he played for QPR. I think it's very important for everyone to realise that. What's your music? Well, it's about Mancini. <laughs> oh, OK, right. Um, I'm going to go for, and I love this because this is basic and it's it's simple. It's 1980s. But Stevie Winwood's Valerie came on in the oh. car the other day. And I just thought, what a simple song. I I just, it's a lovely tune. Now, this is the sickly bit. I am contractually obliged to say that I've got a book out. Here it is. Okay. There's a picture of me on the cover. There's a picture of me on the back. There's a bit of stuff about Top Gear. There's a bit of stuff about my life in general. It's available... And I never thought I'd say this in all good bookshops, which I think oh. is a bit unfair on all bad bookshops. So I like to think there's a lot of very bad bookshops that will also stock it, and I hope they make yeah. some money out of it. Um, yeah, it's it's about that thick, and there Ooh. are pictures inside of cars. I found a picture earlier, reference the Audi 90 Quattro. My oh. father had several of these. He also had the one that was facelifted, and it had um, you know the one that was a bar of soap shape. Yeah, had the smallest wheels you've ever seen on a car. It came as standard with fourteen-inch wheels. Look at the size of them. Yeah, that was a slightly disappointing one. Yeah, that Couldn't mean have. that was not a good car. That one. No. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it'll help me pay for some fuel and maybe you know get my beard cut. A lot of people don't like my beard at the moment. So go and buy my book, please. I beg you. Um, thank you very much to my fellow podcasters, Neil Clifford, Edward Lovett, Chris Cooper, Manish Pandy, and me sitting snaffling in a Welsh hotel. Um, we love you very much and we'll see you soon. Bye.